All right, and now we are ready to get into our first panel. You all ready? Did you bring back that good energy that I told you to bring back? Okay, good. I feel it. All right, let's go ahead and bring out our panelists. Join us, the fabulous Jamila Lemu. Hello. You can give them a warm, a warm welcome to the room, please. All right, here to moderate this conversation is someone who I see a whole lot of on Twitter, I'm sure you do too, and someone who I wish I could see more in real life. We're gonna have to make that happen. Um, acclaimed writer, speaker, columnist, and all around Wonder Woman. I should call you woke Wonder Woman. Um, Jamila Lemu. Joining her are three luminaries who bring new meaning to the phrase, do it for the, cult for the culture. Uh, we have Jerry Teo, Winter Brianne, and Nat Natalia Ansiso. Just to give you a quick summary of, of these intelligent, brilliant people, um, Jerry Teo is a nationally renowned speaker, author, educator, and healer. Uh, activists and organizers in the room may know Winter Brienne as a young leader who helped organize the hashtag Enough National Student Walkout, and she actually was one of the rock stars on Teen Vogue's 21 Under 21 list. She is out here changing the world, uh, so keep your eyes on her. And last but not least, we have Natalia Ansiso, who is a Chicana Tijana visual artist and educator whose work has moved and educated audiences worldwide. So welcome everyone, and I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic over to Jamila to kick off the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you Elaine, and good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for joining us for what I think, uh, what, what certainly has already been uh, a powerful day and what I hope will be a powerful and productive dialogue. Um, I'm going to be asking some questions of our panelists, but we want this to be somewhat free-flowing as if we were having a conversation, I can't say over drinks, so at the dinner table, over some tea, maybe a little kombucha if you're so inclined, I'm not. There we go. It tastes like vinegar. Um, to me personally, I don't want a kombucha shame, just not a fan. Uh, but this should be relaxed and casual, so I don't want to try as best as you can pretend that we're not live streaming and that there are not a bunch of people here watching this all over the world. Um, you know, <laughs> jump in if you hear something that you want to respond to. You don't have to wait to be called on. We're not in school uh, today. No, not today. We have a Howard baby. I'm a Howard. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> I'm, you know. You know. <laughs> so, I'm a Howard. I'm not an OG yet. I'm like a medium old head, and we have an actual Howard baby bison. Baby bison. So, <laughs> I'm over over the moon about that. Um, so let's move to our conversation. I would like to start with you, Jerry. Mm. You have spoke publicly about um, the importance. Obviously, so much of the work you do is around uh, the significance of honoring our culture and you honoring your culture, and you have talked publicly about um, recognizing and, and holding tight to your ancestors, right? And, and looking to them for reminders of um, where we come from, right? Where you come from and that you're rooted in something and that you're rooted in something that matters even when the world around you says that it does not. Um, could you, and I'd like to start with Jerry, but I'd like for both of, uh, for everyone to take this one on. Can you talk about how your heritage and your traditions and rituals have helped to sustain you um, and have helped you to perhaps silence those internalized messages that so many of us get about who we are and where we come from? Well, thank you, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to begin by thanking Creator and the ancestors for, uh, for me being here. And, and as I welcome all of you, I want to also acknowledge all your ancestors. Uh, something that happens to us when we live in this society is they make us believe that we're just us as individuals. And what, what I have come to acknowledge and recognize is that we would not be here without our ancestors. I cannot imagine what my ancestors had to go through in order to for me to be here. I cannot imagine what they had to suffer through and struggle with in order for me to be here. 
my ancestors and all of your ancestors had a dream, had a prayer, had a song, had a wish. And their wish and their song and their dream was that their children and grandchildren would, would live their sacred purpose, would fulfill their dream, would have less pain and have more blessings. And I saw that in my own grandmother. My little grandmother was about four foot ten, you know, little lady. We had to go to the children's department to get her shoes, her little shoes like that. <laughs> and I thought she was crazy. I grew up in Compton, by the way, right? So that little grandma that only spoke uh, Spanish, she knew a couple of phrases in English, but they weren't the good words, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I always learned those words like that. But my little grandma would get up in the morning. I thought she was crazy because she got up at four o'clock every morning. Mm -hmm. And I said, Grandma, why do you get up so early? You don't have to go to you have to go to school, got to go to, she got up at four o'clock in the morning. In that crowded house we lived in, there was a little hole in the wall, if you will. And in that hole in the wall were her sacreds, were her candles and her, her sacred things. There was a pillow on the ground. And my grandma uh, would kneel on that pillow. And you could almost tell how many problems we had, because the more problems we had, the longer she'd stay on that pillow. Mm -hmm. You could see the crease in the pillow. Oh, that's right, that's right, right there. And, uh, but after she finished praying, she'd come to the room where all us kids are sleeping. And she blessed us all up. And I used to get mad at 5.30. Grandma, why are you waking me? I was having a good dream. Why are you waking me up? I say, I mean, I said, why you got to bless me? You blessed me last night before I went to sleep. Is it still good for now? Well, you know, bless me before I go to, get, go to school again. I got tantos blessings. Why you got so many blessings? What I did not understand is my grandma had to inoculate me, had to remind me that I was a blessing and I was sacred just the way I was. Because she knew I was going to go into a world that did not see me as a blessing. That already, because of the way they saw me, they wanted to lock me up, deport me, put me away. They wanted to assimilate me out of who I really was. So that tradition, just of that you are a blessing. So we go around in communities and say, you may not have had that grandma. So let me channel your grandma. Let me bring her here and say to you, all of you, that you are a blessing just the way we are. We are deciding now the sort of ancestors that we will be. That's something I think about often, right? Will someone think of me as that praying grandmother? Am I a force, right, while I'm on this earth? And even when you're not in the earthly plane, the idea that will I have the sort of spirit that can touch people mm -hmm. in that way, right? Um, Winter, for, for you to be a, as young and just accomplished and not just accomplished, there, there are kids that start, you know, break, I don't know, break dance sound. I'm making myself sound a lot older than I am. Kids be break dancing and stuff, but no, but kids, <laughs> on their MySpace and whatnot, but no, but like, <laughs> I don't know. I know that's probably on her like to Google later. My space. Um, oh, I know, I know. That's like where everybody's photos are. Like that's, when you Google like my mom. Yes, my your mom. Mom. Uh, this, but um, I'm sorry. I'm also having a, a day of age reconciliation right now. Uh, but but for you at this point to already be so grounded in who you are. Right? Who was the grandmother in your life? Who helped you to have the presence of, under, the, the understanding of the importance of your culture and your identity, and to take on the work of helping people to recognize and, and respect the power of their experiences that are like yours, and for other people to, to um, be able to experience and understand your culture and your perspective in the way we would want people to experience yeah. it, right? How did you, who was that for you? That's a great question because I had come from a very like blessed and fortunate space where like growing up and still to this day I have four generations in all angles so I have my great grandmothers from four so all of them um, and a great grandfather um, I where I grew up in Riverside California we all lived within 
a mile radius of one another. So mm -hmm. family and community was something that was very important to us. Um, my great grandmother moved there from Missouri, who born and raised on a plantation, um, moved to Riverside um, due to military and being married, um, and kind of just planted roots there and never left. And so after my mom had me, we moved right back to Riverside. Um, and so there's that sense of home in a place where like Riverside, if you guys know or maybe not know. It's a very like, somebody here from IE? That's crazy. Um, <laughs> I'm always like, I'm from LA, I'm from LA. Um, <laughs> um, but having a sense of home in a space that didn't look like home, where like we were like the one black family like in Riverside, um, definitely provided me with the space to understand like my own agency and understand like who I am as a person outside of um, what the world was telling me at the time. Um, I remember like there was a moment where I might have been in, not third grade, because that's my one black teacher. I was in like second grade. And um, I pressed my hair, and it was like the topic of conversation the whole day at school. Everyone was like, oh my god, I love your hair. My teacher was like, Winter, you have to like do that more often. It's so great. Like your hair is so long. And I remember like coming home and telling my mother, like. Mom, I want to wear my hair pressed more often. I really like it. Everyone at school likes it. And it was like in that moment, she was like, you're not wearing your hair pressed. <laughs> <laughs> she said, away with all products. <laughs> you are going to go to school with your fro. And, like, and, and until you love your fro is when I'm like going to like let you play with your hair. Um, and like what that taught me um, was that like it's important to first love myself, and second that the moment that I learn love myself and take up change, I mean take up my own agency and have ownership of that, it's gonna be like the moment the world's gonna follow. Because mm -hmm. next thing you know, like I'm like how everybody hair out, everybody love my hair, and um, so <laughs> all of that to say like it was my mom, it was my grandma, it was my great grandma, um, it was our home. Um, safe spaces that really like cultivated who I am today and allowed mm. me to take up this space that I'm taking up now. Mm. So Natalia, your work is deeply personal yes. and um, so much of it centers around your experiences growing up in the Rio Grande Valley, um, motherhood and um, has been a, a way for you to share your perspective on things that are happening in the world today. I would like to hear about your creative process uh, for sure, but also can you talk about how do you reconcile your experiences, your identity, your politics with creating work that is going to be experienced by people who don't share your values, who don't share your perspective, mm -hmm and some who may want to be empathetic and engage and others who are very clear that this is how I see the world and what you're doing is disruptive and inappropriate. Um, and yet sometimes those are the gatekeepers, right? These are the people that we have to work with in order to do the radical, revolutionary, uh, world-changing um, work that we want to create and do. So how do you show up as yourself in the artistic space wholly and honestly and honoring yourself and your ancestors while um, having to engage with the world that doesn't always understand that perspective? Um, so I grew up in the Rio Grande Valley, um, deep South Texas on the border. And my family is for the sixth generation, so we've lived there um, for years. And my experience um, talking with other artists, talking with um, other people. I'm now based in, in California. Talking with other people, Latinos there, my experience is very different. Um, growing up on the border, I was never like American enough or Mexican enough. And that is something, like the issue with identity is something that I found best to, um, work through like with my art. And that's how I kind of built my consciousness. Um, I went to school at UT Austin. Um, it was very difficult being like one of the on only um, Latinas there in the art program. And then I got into um, 
a private art school for graduate school um, where I was like one of two Latinas. And it was very, it was, it's very difficult. It's very difficult like just trying to find voice. Um, I got a lot of pushback. I've gotten a lot of pushback. And I think what keeps me grounded is knowing, like thinking about my family, knowing where I came from, oftentimes feeling like I am in a position of privilege. Um, I kept hearing like my mom and my grandma and like just my relatives in the background when I wanted to give up, like times that I wanted to give up, I kept hearing their voice like, you know, like you're the one who wanted to do this, so stick it out. Uh, <laughs> I definitely expected that to be like this voice of I know. motivation, like you can do it, stay strong. Like, what is definitely you, you do? can do it, but also like, you know, you know what you're getting yourself into. Mm -hmm. So um, I always, I keep that in the back of my, um, in the back of my head when I'm put in like situations, especially like in art school when you have to like defend your work. Um, and it's very, it's very challenging. Um, I think just, keep, just being like centered, being grounded, thinking um, about where I came from is what, what really helps me. Um, also, art for me is like a sort of meditation. Things, I'm not a very vocal person, um, very, very introverted. And so for me, everything that I can't say, I work through, in, like I work out through my art. Um, and it makes the conversation easy, easier. Like when I show pieces that are my, like might be politically charged, I have people um, approach me and I'm able to have those conversations. I've created pieces where like I've done a dinner table, things like a, um, home. I did an art installation where it's a dinner table and um, people are invited to come sit down and have conversations and just share stories. So it does, it's not really a political conversation that we're having, but it's just an exchange of stories. And um, noticing like how similar, um, you know, our backgrounds can be, even though we're super different. Um, I'm always able to make connections with people through my artwork. Uh, Jerry. So much of your work involves engaging um, traditional cultural practices like meditation and talking circles to help individuals and families to do healing work. Uh, can you talk briefly about how you've seen those practices work, perhaps with folks that are not used to uh, engaging their minds and their bodies and perhaps their loved ones in that sort of way? And how can we, and I know this is not the easiest thing to, to share uh, with a time constraint, but how we can um, employ some of those traditional practices, uh, even if they are not our own traditional cultural practices, to heal and, and to reconcile issues like racism. Uh, and also, if you can briefly talk about the sensitivity that we should have when we are engaging cultural practices that are not our own. Well, wow. uh, in two minutes, okay. Um, <laughs> Can you do 90 seconds? Okay. Well, well let, let, me, let, me just, let me just begin by saying, uh, you know, in, in our traditional way, there's a word called enkloke nawake, and that word means interconnected sacredness. Um, and so before we do anything on the outside, we, we have to make sure we're good on the inside and that interconnection. You know, it, 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 it calls back to you know, acknowledging where I come from and my ancestors, but also my mother that carried me. You know, that, that carried me in her and gave me her song. She gave me that heartbeat. She gave me her breath. She gave me her blood. So uh, on the outward, you may call it meditation or whatever, but really it's, it's, I'm trying to reconnect and get in rhythm with my mother's song. I'm trying to remember and acknowledge in whatever way, that, and it may mean that I need to breathe because this outward world wants me to stop breathing. It may mean that I need to sing a song or chant a, a song for my ancestors because when I sing that song, it reverberates generations back and the grandmas, great grandmas and great grandpas, as I sing that song, their song is coming with me. 
So you may see it just as meditation or prayer, or, but what you may not realize is that we can't do anything outward unless we have done our work inward. And so many of us, you may see run healing circles, you may see us doing what people call meditation, it's really prayer, okay? Uh, but you may see us chanting, you may see us uh, even in sweat lodge and all of that, but you have to understand that that's not just a practice, it's a way of life. So if you don't live that way of life, then that practice does not have the energy, it does not have the medicine, it does not have the connection. You know, but but it's, it's very easy to understand because it's really connected to uh, that sense of balance in our world. And, and that then creates song, it creates rhythm, it creates vibration, and this world wants to take you out of that. And that's why when I was so young, music was so important to me. You know what I mean? And now, you know, I hear old songs, and I, I hear my traditional songs, but if I hear, you know, Temptations, you know I mean? It's just, you know, he stay through my will. I mean, you know, I just like vibe, you know? <laughs> it, it brings me, I mean, seriously, it vibes you to a place where you were your friends, people loved you, they connected with you, you know, it vibes you back. It's kind of that same thing, yeah. right? That, that, that music and song and expression can really bring you back that way, and I think that's what, what we're talking about here. How do you come back to the, that, that rhythm, that true sacredness of who you are? You know, and, 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 you know, and, I, that, and then again, that manifests in the way, I mean, healing circles really are just welcoming people and giving them a space to call back their spirit in a sacred way. Well, I think if there is a space in particular that uh, quite easily can take us as far away as possible from that spirit and from what is inside and, and generations back, it's social media. <laughs> um, and it has been obviously an important tool for many of our work, uh, for the work that many of us do, and, and certainly for you, Winter. Uh, but again, it is a relatively new phenomenon. It is distant from our cultural traditions. Um, and it's requiring us to create new languages and new ways of communicating. So you have used social media, Instagram in particular, uh, your account Black is Lit, to combat stereotypes and talk about um, the work of community leaders and artists, uh, Black artists and community leaders, I should say, that are doing meaningful work. Uh, talk about one, how you, what inspired you to start the project and what you were responding to, and two, how do you protect your spirit mm. while being mm. in public and doing racial justice work in public? Yeah, um, so um, Black is Lit was something I started when I was like 13. Um, I finished like my schooling around ninth grade and I had a lot of time on my hands and my mom's not a fan of like undisciplined time. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> she was like, you need to do something. And like during this time, Black Lives Matter is on the rise. I was really frustrated and being surrounded by a lot of non-black people often made me like feel more frustrated because I felt like I couldn't be understood in a lot of spaces. And a big piece of that my dad is always saying is like, well, like, tell more positive stories. We need more happiness. So I started like going through my neighborhood and pretty much just highlighting the different amazing people, whether it was like the young sports player who like just won a tournament to like this new doctor who opened a practice or like the guy who sings on the corner when I was walking to school at the, like my performing arts school um, and making sure that those stories were being told. And then also like in terms of like protecting myself, I think one, I do um, separate like my work and my activism from like my life. So like if that, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, but in the same way like someone who holds a nine to five, I try to like create those own boundaries with myself only because um, when I don't like I'm gonna be upset and frustrated all the time because the world's a mess and I feel like I have to fix it. Mm. Um, and so with that I create like my own safe spaces and one of those is like in water. Um, growing up, my dad was a swim teacher. He taught us how to swim really young, and like I love water. Water, I feel like, has a lot to do with like healing and cleansing. Um, and so, whenever I'm frustrated, take a bath, hop in the shower. Um, it's when I'm at home in LA, I'll go to the beach because that's always available um, to like create spaces where I know are like only for me. Um, and so, yeah. Mm. <laughs> and two minutes. That was very good. Thank you know, I'm on it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that, I think that's generational too, like that you all Twitter. experience things in short bursts. You know, so. Twitter. Huh? Twitter. I said Twitter. That's it. Yeah. Twitter <laughs> um, 
Natalia, a lot of your work, um, such as Families Belong Together, School and Smile series, bring beauty to experiences that can be incredibly painful um, to endure and perhaps to talk about. How, in your experience, uh, when, with regard to art that can be painful or difficult to create or to process um, as an observer, do you see art as a tool of the racial healing, racial reconciliation process, which is so deeply painful, obviously. That's a big question. Um, I mean, it's, it's art has always been, um, like for me, just, just like a healing practice. I never thought of it that way, um, but being someone who always felt uh, voiceless, um, art just became, like you said, something where I could I could think about all the things that I was trying to process, think about like who I was, and because artwork, because art is just, I mean, for me, visual art is just so personal. Um, and it's easy. I was taught in graduate school by this amazing advisor that I have that it's your story, right? Mm. When you make your, your artwork, you're, it, you're working out your identity, like that's your story, you can't take it away, so you have to back it up. And so when, you, when you're standing up trying to de, um, either just like display your work or defend your work, like that's your truth. No one can take that away from you. Um, so I, can you just remind me of the question again? I feel like I. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you have a word on art as a tool of uh -huh. racial healing and how that's functioned in your work. I mean, just thinking about racial healing and I, like just identity. Like for me, artwork is just so much about identity and you have to know who you are in order to like do that right to start that racial healing process, you have to know like who you are. And for me, like art is a powerful tool, which is why I work with a lot of youth teaching them how to use art as their voice um, in communities where, um, you know, are voiceless. And I, th I think it's super, super important uh, to first like transform yourself, bring attention to issues, and then from there, hopefully, you know, have people take action. And this is, such a great conversation that we certainly could have filled an entire day with just hearing from these three. Um, but we do have to wrap up. So I'd like to give um, each of you all just a, a final moment to share um, one last thought. And since it's early in the day, I think it'd be appropriate perhaps to if you could give just a brief meditation uh, or a thought that you want people to carry with them in regards to racial healing as they go through this day and perhaps participate in healing circles and listen to other uh, art performances and, and dialogues like this one. What would you like for everyone to keep close to their heart and mind on a day like today? You want to begin? Yes, um, please, Jerry. Well, <laughs> I, I, I just reiterate the, the sense of our sacredness and us as blessings, but, but in, our Mayan culture, there's a term called in la quech. And in la quech uh, means tu eres mi otro yo, you are my other me. Mm -hmm. And that was a sacred uh, uh, chant that we, we say that you are my other me, that you're a reflection of me, I'm a reflection of you. When you hurt, I hurt. But when you heal, I heal. Mm -hmm. And so if we can approach each other and embrace each other that way, and we can um, walk with each other so that we can heal together, yeah, uh, but the healing starts internally yourself. And then it must happen in your home and in your own relationships. And then it happens amongst each other as well. You know, healing one piece at a time. And that's where we bring peace in the world. Yeah. Thank you. Um, for me, I, this past, I just got back from um, Ghana. I was able to go there for the year of return with one of my mentors, Bazoma, and it's her birthday, so happy birthday. Mm. Um, <laughs> Um, but there was a moment when we were at the uh, Cape Coast Slave Castle um, where um, our rabbi who was leading us through there said something that really like spoke with me and I made it like my word for 2020. Um, and that is that we are ascendants, not descendants anymore. And at this point in our lives, like we are constantly building on what our ancestors had done for us and generations before us. And it's like only 
it's only like right that we are ascending from the places that we have come and that we can only go up from here because I think mm. a lot of times um, we feel like history repeats itself and like honestly there's no reason it should because we have all the tools to keep it from happening and with that meaning like we have to continue in our own spaces to do the work to continue doing um, the work that those before us have done to not give up because of like the labor that it took for you to even exist in this world right now. And so with that, I would just like to propose to you guys that we are ascendants, not descendants, and we are ascending. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, it's knowing your truth and knowing that we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. Um, always going back and thinking. And I'm so glad you mentioned Ilakesh because that's what I start um, every class with. And I have the kids mm. say that to each other. Um, but just knowing, knowing your truth, starting with you first, and, um, and just really you know, staying grounded, reminding yourself of your ancestors, where you came from. And it's your truth. No one can take it away from you. Mm. Well, with that, can we please have a round of applause? Thank you so much to uh, the panelists for their wise words this morning. Thank you all for your attention and your time. And uh, I hope that you all have a phenomenal, productive, and enlightening day. Thank you. Thank you.